Hello my pooligans, Chewy of the Mana Pool here again to do the introduction. This is the third part of the James Webb Space Telescope stream that Clues and I did, and this is the part everyone's been waiting for. The pretty space pictures! We're going to take a look at the first batch of JWST images that were released and talk about them. Before diving into this one though, I still recommend you watch the first two parts about how we got to the JWST in the first part, and all about the JWST itself in the second part. But in this one, we'll explain in mostly plain English what's in each image and why that's totally freaking awesome. What's a nebula? What's a planetary nebula? What happens in a galaxy collision? What are all of these smears? There's even a discussion of Einstein's general relativity at the end. But don't worry, it's mostly just me being excited about how awesome uh, reality is. But enough of me talking, let's get into it. So everyone, take a deep breath, because this is the deep end. Yum. Dum 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 jam! Um, so they gave us some engineering images early on, and when I saw those engineering images, I was blown away at, at what this thing was achieving. But they didn't release much data for a while, and they did that on purpose, okay? It, it takes time to properly process astronomical data. And people hear stuff like that, and they're like, oh, they're photoshopping the images? No, no, you need to understand that Astronomical images, as they come off of a telescope, they look like garbage. They look awful. Until you calibrate them, until you process them, until you clean all of the defects that are in the image, that are inherent to the detector that's in the image, until you clean all that stuff up, it looks awful. And what's more, the images you're going to see that we're going to show you in just a moment, those images are not a single image. It's not like a camera that you just take, it's not like your cell phone, you point at anything, you take a picture and then the picture just pops up. That's not how this works, no, no, no. You take hundreds, perhaps thousands of images and combine them together to get the color images that you're then going to see, okay? So, they held off on showing us images until they had a few to show us. And this was, I think, savvy from a, a PR standpoint. Because imagine if they had shown you the first image as soon as it came off. Okay, everyone would go, okay, great. And then, like two weeks later, they showed you another image that, that was ready to go. Uh, okay, great. All of those things, if they dribble out the images, it's going to get lost in the wash of the current media landscape. So they decided to instead make uh, a PR event out of it, and they carefully chose some specific targets to try and show off the capabilities of the telescope, which is another criticism that I've heard that, oh, these images aren't real science. That's not true. These images are carefully chosen science to show off some of the capabilities. They're not everything that it's capable of, but they are some of the prettiest things, the kinds of things that people might be able to understand why this is so interesting. Um, so, without further ado, let's show one of the first light images from the JWST, and we're gonna go in distance order, so we're gonna start with stuff relatively close, and we're gonna work our way out, and I'm gonna try and explain a little bit about the images that you're seeing, why they're interesting, why they're important. So here it is. This is, this is uh, what I called when uh, the press conference was happening, because I watched the press conference live where they were releasing these. I called this uh, one of the most beautiful pictures I had ever seen. And I still maintain that. I think it's number two, actually, in most beautiful uh, pictures I've ever seen. Um, this is a planetary nebula. Now, don't get distracted by the name. A planetary nebula has nothing to do with planets, but we didn't know that at the time. When planetary nebulae yeah. were discovered, they were discovered with small telescopes that people were using eyepieces with. So think back to, and in fact, the name planetary nebula, we believe, was coined by William Herschel, the same guy who discovered Uranus. So when yeah. I said that uh, 
uh, he, he named some things that were kind of problematic. Here's one of them. Um, the reason he called it a planetary nebula is what he could see through his eyepiece was this kind of uh, diffuse cloud-like thing with a dot in the middle. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't this object that he discovered. This is a thing called the Southern Ring Nebula. It's viewable from the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and all planetary nebula, I'm not going to say they look exactly like this, but they look similar. There's a, a diffuse band of clouds out around the edges, and there's, there's a little dot in the center. This one happens to be about 2,000 light years from Earth, so it is relatively nearby. It is the death of a low-mass star. So what do I mean by a low-mass star? Basically anything under about eight times the mass of the sun or so. There's a little bit of debate as to where exactly that line is, but you know, data like this will help us to understand. Uh, Anything that's uh, less than about eight times the mass of the sun and lower, this is how they die. The outer layers of the star get blown off into space in, in a series of waves, and that's what you're seeing here. You're seeing multiple waves of material that was blown off that star. Now you might think, okay, so the dot in the center, this, this bright thing with those diffraction spikes, uh, that is our dead star. No, actually it's not. If you look very carefully right next to it, and Chewie, I think you can zoom in on, on yeah. it for me here. The actual you dead can, star is right here. You somewhere. can just barely make out in the edge of that diffraction spike, right there. that's the actual dead star. This other one happens to be a binary companion. This is two stars that orbit each other. So the one that died is the faint one, and we're going to see a better view of it in just a second. The bright one that still remains is still living its life. Now, And so its uh, um, motion and its light and its radiation, it influenced some of this gas that got blown off. Yeah. The, uh, this is the thing that always seems to blow people away. Binary star systems are extremely common. Very much so. Like the fact that we're not a binary system is the weird part. Like nearly half of the stars that you see in the sky are at least a binary. They yeah. might be a trinary or a quaternary or even more than that, but about half are are not single stars. Uh, yeah. Now, if, if you'll if you'll zoom over, back out, for you, me, you can see here. Clues was talking about the outer layers getting popped off in in waves, and you can make out the waves. Here's one. Here's one. You can see like. Like a wave, you can see the peaks in the troughs. Yeah, the the amount of detail that we're seeing in this is just absolutely shocking. Um, And I think it really looks like a three-dimensional image, at least to me. Um, But while we're on this image, I want to try and answer a couple of common questions that come up. Yep. Uh, Common question number one was actually asked in the chat here just a moment ago. Uh, What do the colors mean? Like, what what are we looking at here? the first thing to understand is that the JWST does not see light like you do. So if you flew out in space, this is not what you would see. The JWST is viewing light that is redder than the human eye can see. And the way they've chosen to try and interpret this is they take the bluest of the red light you can't see and they map it to blue so that you can see it. Mm -hmm. And they take the light that's kind of in the middle of the red light that they see, the infrared light, and they map that to green, Mm -hmm. and they take the reddest of the infrared light that they have, and they map that to red. And so that's how you get this composite RGB, this red, green, blue image that gives you these colors that you're seeing right here. Yeah, Um, they they take the, what, so, to get super rudimentary, light is a spectrum. We only see the tiniest little fraction of it that we call visible light because we can see it, but, Like radio waves are the same thing all the way down to gamma radiation is or gamma waves are the same thing. It's just different speeds, not speeds. Uh, No, not speeds, um, different wavelengths. wavelengths. Yeah, it's definitely not different speeds. Um, So in a way, if you had infrared eyes, yes, this is what you would see. Yeah. But But since we don't have infrared eyes, the only way for us to see it is to shift those colors into colors we can see. Yeah. They take it and they go, okay, here would be the edge of uh, this edge of visible light. Here would be this edge of visible light. And they just move it over. Yeah. They just shove it over, essentially. Essentially. So this particular instrument that we're looking in uh, right now is a thing called the near infrared camera. So it's light that is kind of just into the infrared. It's not super far into the infrared, but basically just outside of human vision that we're looking at here. And so what we're seeing is the gas that's around that star. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that gas is being uh, uh, lit up. It's, it's, it's glowing 
because of the light from uh, its companion, among other things, that's causing that gas to glow. Um, and this is now, this is pretty common in planetary nebula. Is this blue glow in the yes. middle? Now, the other question that gets asked is, hey, why is it a circle? Shouldn't it like be a sphere? And uh, there's a couple of things going on there. First of all, um, it can be less round than this. Some of these planetary nebula are quite chaotic. So uh, they often have really interesting names uh, like the Cat's Eye Nebula or the yeah. Dumbbell Nebula. But yeah. a lot of them look pretty ring-like like this one does. This is called the Southern Ring because it looks ring-like. It is three-dimensional. It's just that since you're viewing it from the top, you know, if you think about this as being a sphere, okay, think about like, a, a, a take like a, a ball, like a basketball. If you were to take and look like straight down, like if you were trying to, trying to puncture something through a basketball, if you go straight down, you're going through a very thin layer of the basketball. But if you poke it instead through the side, like out where it's curving away, you're gonna go through a lot more material as you push through that, as you're trying to like drive a, a needle into the basketball. I don't know why you're using a needle in a basketball. Look, it was the best I could think of as I panicked. Uh, but you're looking through a very thin layer of gas when you're looking down in the very middle. So it looks like there's nothing there, but there is, there's totally gas there, okay? So uh, before we leave this image, I want to point out, Chewy, if you'll point over up into the left, there's this like streak that's going diagonally, like out near the edge of this image, up into the left, right over there. Yeah, that is an entire other galaxy that's behind this thing. Yep. So it I just so happened that it's, it's lined up on the sky. So as we're looking at the planetary nebula, there's this galaxy that's behind it. Yeah, I think this is um, too, is, right? which is pretty neat. Uh, that is probably also another galaxy off in the background. I mean, yeah. again, it, no matter where you look, we're going to find galaxies. All yeah, the all of these back here are galaxies off in the background because... And so if you look, yeah. we're seeing those diffraction spikes on all the bright objects, just like we expected. Yep. So again, you, you can tell stars from not stars or bright stars from not stars by, uh, by looking at those. Yeah, so, so if we go... Like right here, and these two obviously, and this one over here, these are stars that are in our galaxy that are much closer than these galaxies of the diffraction spikes. Yeah. So foreground object. It's like when you're taking a, a picture and your thumb, your finger gets in the way, it's, it's overexposed. That, that's how my brain thinks of it. Yeah, no, that's is, totally fair. Is when you take your, 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 your picture and your stupid fingers in the way, then your finger is very bright and everything else behind the flash is not washed out, but your finger is. That's a quick way to think of a diffraction spike. It's not completely accurate, but it's it's a good analogy. Yeah, it's, it's good enough. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if we could go to the, the next image in our sequence here, we're gonna see another view of this exact same nebula, but we're gonna see it with a different camera. And so we're now gonna go from the near infrared camera to the mid infrared camera. So it has a much different look to it because we're looking at different things. So first of all, by going to the, the mid infrared rather than the near infrared, we're going to things that uh, aren't just glowing gas. Now we're seeing the, the warmth or the heat of the dust that's surrounding this. So the nebulous part isn't gas anymore, it's now dust. But we can now see the companion star, the one that died the little red one that's kind of down into the left of the kind of blue one that's in the middle there, yeah, right there. that's the star that actually died. And it's still surrounded by uh, not quite a cocoon, but maybe a, a shell of warm dust that's still around its surface. And that's why it's, it's glowing like it is in the mid infrared here. Um, but we're seeing all this dust that's also blown off. I should mention that cosmic dust, like dust in space, is not quite the same as dust in your house. Dust in your house is totally gross, like absolutely horrible. It's mostly dead skin cells and hair and, and all kinds of awful Ooh. stuff. And yeah, you probably need to dust. I think that's a myth that it's mostly dead skin. But anyway. Oh, okay. Well, there's plenty of dead skin in there. I'll tell you that. But it's certainly not like this dust. This dust is primarily carbon and carbon compounds that are made in the outer envelopes of these kinds of stars as they're dying. So in their later stages of life, before they blow off all of their outer layers, they make a bunch of this dust. Yeah. Now, we are a little bit surprised at just how much dust is still present here. 
and we think that may be influence from its companion, but either way, we're learning like brand new things from like the first images that are coming off of this. And if you zoom back in on those galaxies, you can see there's, there's some uh, uh, mid-infrared light coming off of those galaxies, so you can see them again uh, off to the side there. Uh, so they look really nice. You'll also notice, and I think this is the case, I think it's actually real, the resolution on the mid-infrared camera is worse than the resolution on the near-infrared camera. Yeah. So Which, just that's as the a way comparison, for the near-infrared, this is 100%. So th this is 100% zoom. This is actual size. So it can get much bigger. But for the uh, near-infrared, that's 100%. Uh, and another question that comes up with these planetary nebula, um, like how long do they last? A few tens of thousands of years is all these things last before they really stop glowing and they're not going to be visible anymore. Um, how big a cross is this? The nebula itself is usually about a light year or so in, in diameter. So uh, they're, they're fairly big, but relatively short-lived. So uh, yeah. you live at a, a neat time in history that we can actually see yeah. these things. Now, uh, this is how our sun is going to die. Our sun's not going yeah. to explode in a supernova because it's very tiny. So It is, it is definitely so small. Th this, is, this is how our sun will die in however many... Uh, years. About five billion years. Yeah, there we take. go. So in about five billion years, come back, you won't recognize the place. It'll look more like this, except without a companion star because we just have the one. Yeah, just cover um, that up. But, there we go. <laughs> but but there you go. So that that is the Southern Ring Nebula. Absolutely beautiful object. These images are absolutely amazing. Um, so Ooh, there's a, another uh, question in the chat. Those waves will destroy life on Earth if any exists. Actually, I think the sun itself will just grow. Uh, Yes. So during the later stages of the sun's life, it, it actually fluffs up mm -hmm. and the surface of the sun is going to consume Mercury. It's going to consume Venus. It may come far enough to consume the Earth completely as well. Uh, but even if it doesn't, as it expands, the temperature on Earth will increase. And in about two billion years or so, the surface temperature on the Earth will roughly be that of molten iron. So uh, we're screwed by that point, is yeah. I, I think the scientific uh, uh, definition of, of how that goes. Yeah. Um, so that is a star, a low mass star dying. Yeah. So remember, Clue said this uh, thing that we're seeing here is somewhere around ish a light year across. So like this is way beyond solar system. This yeah. is way beyond anything relatively close to how far we are from the sun. So yeah, yeah, our, our solar, if you think about the orbits of the planets, so like out to Neptune or so you're talking light hours, not even light days. This is a light year across. Yeah. So uh, if we go on to our next image, which is the actual like most beautiful image I've ever seen. And oh man, well, this is just... the, the three comparison. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. This is the comparison. Okay. Then well, the one at the bottom is the one that we want. Um, this is a really good illustration of, uh, how far we've come technologically. So this is a little detail of a thing called the Carina Nebula that we're about to talk about. Yep. The image at the top is that, that Carina Nebula as seen from uh, a telescope on Earth. Mm -hmm. um, this is a telescope from uh, La Silla Observatory in Chile, which I believe ah, is in okay. the Atacama Desert of Chile. I don't know which telescope this was taken from. There are several telescopes there. But the biggest telescope there is about 2.5 meters. But it's, it's, a, it's a beefy telescope from the ground. Yeah. But that's about the best you're doing from the ground. The next image down, the middle image in here, uh, we're looking at a Hubble Space Telescope image. And you can so, tell again from the four this diffraction spike. For many, many years, this was like, uh, I'm not going to call it a, a poster child, but it was definitely some eye candy from uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. I have yeah, an astronomy I mean, textbook that this is the cover of the, the textbook is this Carina Nebula from yeah. the Hubble Space Telescope. But I mean, um, but just, at the bottom of this image, just just before we get to, to that, just look at the, the difference. Like this is looking through the atmosphere, all of the stupid breathable uh, air that's in the stupid way. And then this, like it's, it's an order of magnitude different. Like, the, yeah. Just it, going to space changes everything. Yeah, because it, you said if this was taken with that, the two and a half meter, um, whoops, 
the two and a half meter uh, mirror here is about roughly the same as Hubble. Yeah, that's as far as size. size of mirror goes. So, yeah, just the difference here is staggering. It's staggering. <laughs> and then, then we bring in the big guns. Then we bring in the JWST. And what does the extra resolution of a larger mirror and different wavelengths and what does it get you? Oh my God. It is a whole nother level of staggering. <laughs> so you can tell uh, again, if you look at those diffraction spikes, you can immediately tell the bottom one is JWST. The yep. one above is Hubble. Yep. You know, you can, you can just, once you know these things, once you're in the know and you're now in the know, uh, you because can just tell. On Facebook and various social medias, people will love to go, oh, look, here's this new picture from the new telescope. And you'd be like, that's a 10-year-old image from Hubble. Stop it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And now you know. Now half you know. the battle, blah, blah, blah. It is totally half the battle. Um, okay, so if you could bring up the full resolution one of it, provided it doesn't grind your computer to a halt, because my goodness, this image is <laughs> very, very high resolution. Yeah. Uh, at so full here screen, is how that, high resolution this is at full screen here is 11% of the full size of, of the resolution. So I, I want to <laughs> say this PNG because you can go download the, the actual full PNG. Uh, it is something like 120 megs Ele for just is, this single image. It is 124 megabytes. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Uh, so this, oh my goodness, this is just spectacular. This is, this is a thing that has been dubbed the cosmic cliffs. Um, that is a very poetic way to describe what this is. Yeah. Um, what we're seeing here is just a tiny, tiny piece of a thing called the Carina Nebula. And so this is in the constellation of Carina. Oh. Uh, it is, again, I believe, a southern hemisphere object. We completely um, forgot about the web compare for the last one. We'll go back and do that when we're done with this. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. We'll, we'll do that when, when, we, when we come back from this. Um, this is a star-forming region. So, you know, we saw in the last one, we saw a star that was dying. We saw it, 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 the, the, the gas getting blown off. That gas that got blown off, it will eventually go to form a new generation of stars. This is what you're seeing here, is a new generation of stars that are being formed. This diffuse, like, brownish, reddish nebula down here at the bottom, this is gas that is forming into stars. Mm -hmm. And just above, kind of just off to the image on the top, are some bright, hot, blue stars that were just born. And this cosmic cliff, this edge that you're seeing here, is the light and the radiation just pushing on this gas from those newborn stars. And it's creating these knots and these pockets and these filaments. And so this is a, what's, what's been dubbed a stellar nursery is the poetic way to describe it. Scientists will call it an H1 region. It'll look like H with a capital I next to it, an H1 region. That just means that it's neutral hydrogen and mm -hmm. neutral hydrogen is what you form stars out of, mm -hmm. primarily. There are other elements present, but it's primarily hydrogen. Most of the universe is hydrogen. I like to joke that if you went and you bought the universe at the grocery store, and you looked at the ingredients on the side, it would be, uh, your ingredients would be hydrogen, helium, and spices. And spices would be everything else <laughs> that isn't hydrogen or helium, but there's so little of it that they don't actually have to tell you the ingredients anymore. So yeah. uh, thank you, USDA, for our universe in a box. Um, Chewy, could you zoom in a little bit on that kind of junction between the, the bluish and the, the reddish in this image for me? Just anywhere, uh, just anywhere there. along there oh, is yeah. fine, kind of near the middle. Perfect. Um, if you look, you can see kind of a, a light blue that's coming off the top of these cosmic cliffs. That is actually ionized hydrogen. Mm -hmm. So the reddish brownish stuff, that is, that, is, that is neutral hydrogen, normal hydrogen gas. And the radiation from the stars just off and up and to the right, those are pushing on this gas, but they're ionizing the front edge of it. And so you can think of that as gas that's kind of evaporating off of the nebula. But this push that it's giving it, it creates these swirls and these knots. It creates places that are slightly more dense than they were before, and it can trigger star formation in here. So basically, once one star starts to form in one of these big nebula, although it starts to sweep some of the gas away, it can also trigger some new star formation. And so you're seeing some uh, bright and dark areas in this, this reddish brownish gas here. And the dark areas are areas with lots of dust. 
And it's inside of those pockets of dust are probably where stars are forming right now, like this instant. Well, not really this instant, because I suppose we should talk about that. Um, the Carina Nebula is about 7,600 light years away. So it is, again, relatively nearby. But this is how it looked 7,600 years ago, because it's taken that amount of time for the light to get to us. So again, astronomy is the ultimate in archaeology. We are looking back in time every time we're looking out. The further out we look, the further back in time we're looking, which is going to be important later. But you see, look at all of these things that have these spikes on them. Those are all nearby bright stars. Everything that has those spikes is a nearby bright star. Um, if you pan kind of up and to the right for me, in the, in the blue area up and to the right, we can actually spot a couple of galaxies in the background. Um, they're in there someplace. I found them just before... It, they're in there. Just zoom okay, in anywhere wait. in the blue space and you'll probably find a galaxy. Okay, up and to the right. Quite, okay, up here. quite frankly. Oh, yeah, I see some right here. There's one. Another one yeah, right so there. anytime you find a thing that isn't a dot, a thing that's kind of smudgy, you'll go, oh, hey, look, a galaxy. Oh, yeah. hey, look, another galaxy. It's like, uh, where's Waldo if there were lots Ooh. of Waldos there's and they're one. absolutely everywhere? Ooh, there's a good one right there, yeah. Yeah, so there's tons and tons of galaxies in the background of these things. By the um, way, this so is 100% zoom. So this is yeah. actual size. And, I, I mean, this image was made from... Uh, I think hundreds, possibly thousands of, of images in this, uh, in this single image. Ooh, there's so, right there. uh, you know, that's, that's why we couldn't just, oh, why don't you just release the data as soon as it comes off the telescope? Well, if we did that, you're, you're not going to see this. Mm -mm. You're going to see grayscale, and you're going to see it with a bunch of defects, and you're not going to see it combined in any meaningful way. So there's tons of things about star formation. There's tons of details in this that we just could not see before in yeah, any me, way. Let me back it up. Like, again, jumping from ground-based, where it was just a, all smudgy, to the Hubble, we got a lot of, like, hints of structure in this where we could see and get more of an idea of what was going on. But in... Uh, with the JWST, we can see just insanely fine details. Like, all of this was kind of a smudge before. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's kind of like uh, when you when you get new glasses and suddenly everything looks good again. It's kind of like that. Uh, yeah. Speaking of uh, looking good again, there is a website that someone has set up where they compare Hubble and JWST images. And we could flip over to that. Let's just take a quick look. Uh uh, let's let's uh, let's start with uh, oh yeah we'll we'll start with this one yes yeah, so there's a little slider and you can wipe back and forth and you can see they're overlaid perfectly and you can see how much more detail we get in there how many more objects we can see in there that we couldn't before like, oh and I can zoom in like look where where was it right here eh like right right here it's just a a, a differently colored smudge in with the Hubble, but oh, look at that! <laughs> it's absolutely amazing what what the JWST does. Yeah, and this whole this whole area right here that is uh, dark, you can see all of the the filaments of dust and whatnot. Here, it was just kind of a greeny smudge. Now, part of this is not just that we've got a bigger mirror. It's also that we're looking at different wavelengths. In infrared, yes. So the infrared wavelengths, one of their benefits for the nearby universe is that they go through dust more easily than visible wavelengths. So remember, Hubble was primarily a visible wavelength instrument. So there's a lot of dust in this nebula that's blocking our ability to see the things that are back there. And if you have it, an infrared instrument, you can suddenly peer through that dust. It's, it's like... Uh, I've heard it described as, uh, imagine if you uh, uh, live in uh, like San Diego and you can't see the bridge because it's a foggy day. Well, JWST, because it looks at different wavelengths, it's like being able to see through the fog. Yeah. So that's kind of what we're doing here. So uh, the resolution is better both, or the detail is better both because we have better resolution because we have a bigger mirror, 
but also because we're looking at different wavelengths as yeah. we look in here. Uh, and could we could we go to the, a quick comparison of uh, the Southern Ring oh, yeah. between uh, JWST and and Hubble because that's also on this page. Once it loads, yeah, there we go. So uh, first of all, the view of the Southern Ring from Hubble, which did just show me just the Hubble. This alone was a stupendous image when it oh, was yeah. first made. Oh yeah, I I remember this from uh, like middle school, high school. The whatever. amount of detail there is insane and you can see the companion star down in there yeah it's right next there. to next to the bright star yeah, it's right, it's right there. uh this was a revolution being yeah. able to see this amount of detail we were crazy happy but then jwst comes along and if we slide the slider the other way we Just go from that the, to the difference that. so this really starts to put into perspective what a a, a huge leap forward in technological capability this is uh, having the James Webb online, having the JWST ready to go. Um, so that was uh, a star that was dying. In, in this image, we had stars that were forming in uh, uh, the Carina Nebula that we were looking at. Um, but why don't we go on to another image from uh, uh, their release, and that is a thing called Stefan's Quintet. And so we're going to move out in space quite a bit, and so here, we're interested not in single stars and what they're doing, but we're looking at, at entire galaxies and what they're doing. And so uh, this oh. is a, a fairly famous set of objects uh, called hey Stefan's Clues? Quintet. Yeah. There, there was a, another question I forgot to, to bring up. How, oh, sure. how, how, how far across is the Carina Nebula? At least the, the bit we can see, if not the whole thing. Yeah, the bit we so can see I, in this picture, rather. I, I don't actually recall offhand. This is a teeny tiny little slice of the Carina Nebula. I can tell you the Carina Nebula itself is a fairly large chunk of the sky. Now, I'm an astronomer, so what I mean by a large chunk of the sky and what other people mean by a large chunk of the sky, I don't actually, I, I don't think you've necessarily, we're not necessarily working in the same numbers here. Um, oh, but here I we think, go. Uh, it's 230 light years across, according to the first thing that Google tells me. Yeah, that's probably about right. Yeah. So it's it's a few hundred light years across. Now, that's not one what side the other. That's not is. the piece that we're looking at. Yeah, this is, this a tiny is much slice much of smaller. That. Yeah, yeah. So this is just a little piece of of that that nebula. Um, Stefan's quintet, which is where we're headed to now, is yeah. a little further away. Okay, we're going to go outside of our uh, own galaxy. So our own galaxy, again, to put to try and put things into perspective, the Milky Way galaxy is about a hundred thousand light years across. Yeah. So a hundred thousand years moving at the speed of light to go from one edge of the, the Milky Way to another edge of the Milky Way. What we're looking at here are five galaxies. At first glance, it looks like oh, there are only four, but no. If we start kind of at the top, there is kind of a swirly galaxy with a nice bright spot in the middle there. Right if we go down a little bit, there are actually two galaxies that are merging together. So if you see the two bright spots together below it, yeah. that's Steve. two galaxies that are currently merging. And if we go below those, there's yet another galaxy. So that brings us up to a total of four. Those four galaxies are about 290 million light years away. 290 million years moving at the speed of light. And to put that into perspective, uh, 65 million years ago, dinosaurs roamed the Earth. So yeah. this light has been traveling to us longer than dinosaurs have been extinct is what it comes down to. Yeah. Now on the left there, there's that other galaxy that looks much sharper. Like you can see more individual stars in that galaxy on the left. Yeah. That's because that's a foreground galaxy. It's actually closer to us. It is a mere 40 million light years away. Yep. So that light came to us from after the dinosaurs died. But this image is a really good illustration of why astronomy is both exciting and infuriating. <laughs> this image, this single image, even ignoring all the stuff in the background, just looking at the big stuff, we are looking at a difference of like 250 million years between the galaxy in the foreground and the galaxy in the background. So we're seeing two different slices of what the universe looks like at two different points in time. But the galaxies in the background, they are all merging together. Those four uh, that we're in a vertical line. Two of them are merging right now. Yep. If we look at the one just above those two, 
it's starting to merge. And so you can see kind of a wisp of gas coming off of it headed down to the other two. And the one down below is close enough that it's also going to merge with the others. Now, uh, this kind of galaxy merger that you're seeing here, um, it's a slow motion train wreck. Okay, this, this actual merger, like if you, if you had phenomenal cosmic power and you could just sit here and watch those galaxies merge forever, like you could just wait as long as it's going to take, it would take hundreds of millions of years for those galaxies to merge, perhaps a billion years for those galaxies to merge. And when they do, uh, most of them won't hit anything else. Like yeah. the stuff inside of the galaxies, they're mostly empty space. So almost no stars will run into other stars, at least not immediately, as they go and smash into each other. So this is an amazing, amazing image, watching how galaxies merge together. But if you look in the background, nearly everything in here that doesn't have a diffraction spike on it is another galaxy. Like if you just go anywhere in this image and zoom in, there's just galaxies absolutely everywhere, which is absolutely stunning when you look at these things. This image alone is 150 million pixels, and it's constructed from over a thousand individual images. So the, the wealth of data from even just the, um, you know, just the most casual glance at the universe that uh, JWST does is just Oops. shocking. Yeah, um, like it, it's, any picture that the the JWST takes is just going to be photobombed by just thousands yeah, that's, of that's extra things in the background. I'll go and hey, hey, hey. <laughs> we are we are photobombed by the universe. Uh, a question came up. Um, at, at, as I said, these mergers take place uh, hundreds of millions of years for a merger to occur, from basically when they start to interact until they smush together. Uh, could could be as much as a billion or so. Uh, depending on the size of the galaxies and how fast they're moving when they come near each other. Yeah. Um, but what's we can cool, also now... Oh, what's cool about galactic mergers is that we'll be in one in the future uh, because the is, Andromeda gal point. galaxy is actually moving towards us. It's, it's a little more fair to say we're moving toward the Andromeda galaxy because it's slightly bigger than the Milky Way. Okay, it's a lot bigger than the Milky yeah, it was, Way. It's so a lot are, bigger than us, yeah. We are falling toward the Andromeda galaxy. In fact, the Milky Way go. will collide with Andromeda in give or take 5 billion years. So about the time the sun is ending its lifetime, we will be slamming into the Andromeda galaxy. Yeah. Um, now, uh, JWST is not one instrument, it's several, so we can also do some really interesting stuff. So if we switch from so, looking at the near-infrared camera, which is what we're doing here, yeah, this one's we look near. at the mid... So remember, this was, for the southern ring, this was near-infrared, this is mid-infrared, okay? Yeah. So then if we jump to Stefan's quartet, this, or quintet, this is the near-infrared and now, if we this switch to the mid, is the mid infrared. And what's really interesting about this image is we're now seeing through a lot of the gas and dust that's in those. Mm -hmm. We're seeing some of the warm dust that's in those. But there's a neat thing that's happened up here. Now, we aren't quite seeing that last galaxy down at the bottom. I think it's a little off the image. Yeah. But look up here at this top galaxy. Do you see that giant diffraction spike? It's now in the middle of that yeah. top galaxy. Now, just as a reminder, we do not have a diffraction. Well, we do, but not a massive not, one. Not anything like in that. In the near infrared. Yeah. But in the, the mid infrared, we're peering down into the center of that galaxy and we're seeing the core. Not the movie, the core. That's a horrible movie. Don't watch it. Don't but watch what that. What we're seeing there is there is a supermassive black hole at the center of that galaxy. We believe there's a supermassive black hole at the center of, of every galaxy. And that supermassive black hole is currently uh, accreting matter. There's a swirling disk of gas that's falling into that black hole. And that's causing all of this light that you see here. This is a thing called an active galactic nuclei. It's the center of a galaxy, and it's active because it's giving off gobs and gobs of light. Um, and so that is an active galaxy in the act of being active, if that makes sense. And you can see how it looks very different when we look at it with a certain set of wavelengths, when we look at the near infrared, versus when we look at it with the mid infrared. 
So JWST has that capability that it can, it can switch between these instruments and get us more than one view. And there are views that the human eye could not, this image is impossible with the Hubble. You can't do it because the Hubble cannot see those wavelengths. Yeah. So uh, again, I, I don't want to say that the Hubble is obsolete because it's not. The Hubble is a complement to JWST. They could both look at this object. We could study it in visible light, near infrared light, mid infrared light simultaneously and learn so much more than if we just looked at it with one instrument. So they will work in tandem in, did, in many ways. Did we ever launch an X-ray space telescope? Uh, we did. Yeah, yes. The, the Chandra Sekar, right? Uh, the, the Chandra X-ray telescope. Yes, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, okay. So we've had X-ray, we've had uh, UV, we've had a gamma ray. Gamma ray telescopes are really hard to make. Uh, and we've had optical. We're now in the infrared, and we're about to see why the infrared is so very important. Not just because we can peer through the gas and dust to see the centers of galaxies, but when we get to this next picture, oh goodness, this next picture, which I'm not going to say it takes my breath away, but it comes. it's definitely in like my top three. Uh, this was the first image that was released. Uh, and this is an object called SMAX-14. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, SMAX J0723.3-7327. And I want to pause right there because astronomers name things and people are like, why did you give me a phone number? Like, wh why is there an IP address in the name of your object? Okay, so first of all, it's called SMAX, S-M-A-C-S. And that stands for the Southern Massive Cluster Survey. So it looks at clusters of galaxies. Then the phone number that comes after it, the 0723.3 minus 7327, that's because in the sky, it's at coordinates 7 hours, 23.3 minutes, and minus 73 degrees, 27 minutes declination. So yeah. the numbers mean something. It's where you look on the sky to find this object. It's, it's so, the smacks. outward equivalent of latitude and longitude, ascension and declination. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Oh, um, also, you know what we forgot? What's that? We forgot the web compare again. Oh, we did forget the web compare again. Okay, let's so, let's go web compare with uh, Stefan's. There we go. So yeah, this was Hubble, which still looks actually amazing. It looks great. It looks absolutely amazing. Like in the visible light, we get a nice view of the, the structure of the two merging, like currently merging galaxies here. But then, oh, <laughs> the infrared though. The infrared though. <laughs> look at how much more you can see. Look, look at how many background galaxies just pop into existence. Yeah. When you like, do that. Like looking, hang on, looking right here. What? what hello it's just now i i do could you scroll back up a little bit to that nearby galaxy the foreground galaxy at 40 yep. billion light years that's just above there and can you swipe back and forth for me with Ooh. uh with hubble Ooh. versus jwst yeah notice how we're seeing different details mm -hmm. the visible light shows us certain kinds of structures yeah, like we have the, the, the spiral infrared arms. light shows us different kinds of structures yeah, invisible we have the spiral arms that you'd expect from it, uh, a galaxy but then in, in infrared we it just looks like a mess so we're seeing very different things. So again, the, the JWST doesn't make Hubble's, Hubble obsolete. They work together to give us a more full picture of what's going on in the universe. Yeah. Like it's the difference between looking at bones and at uh, uh, vasculature, you know? Yeah. It, it, you might think of it as the difference between an MRI and an X-ray. Right? Yeah. If you're thinking about the human body, you're seeing, you do those for different reasons and you're seeing different structures. Mm -hmm. And just because you have an MRI doesn't make an x-ray obsolete. They look at different things. And so you're probably going to, maybe, let's just say hypothetically, you screwed up your knee two months ago. You might get both an x-ray to see what the bones are doing and an MRI to see what the ligaments are doing. Not that I would know from experience, except that I know from experience. Yeah. What did you do? I just screwed up my knee running. Oh. So, yeah, I tore I my ACL I, years ago in college. 
I'm in my mid-40s, and I decided to go for a jog. That's literally the entire story. I didn't mean what'd you do to hurt yourself. I meant what got hurt, you goober. <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying that getting old sucks. Don't do it if you, if you can avoid it. Um, so can we see the bottom? Uh, let's, again? oh yeah, here we go. Let, haven't looked let's go back one. to, Ooh. look, this is all pretty, but you know, we're, we're pushing two hours here. Let's go see smacks. Yes, sir. One smacks coming right up. One smacks coming right up. So when I first pulled this up, I don't know, uh, if you, you noticed, you probably didn't, but I, I got tears in my eyes and then luckily clues pulled me out of it with the phone number bit. So. Oh, it's so, it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. So uh, zoom in kind of on the center for me. One of those big, like whitish, yellowish round balls of galaxy, right? Yeah, right in, right in there, if you could, please. Yep. Um, so the actual galaxy cluster in question are these kind of fuzzy white blobs, okay? Mm -hmm. This is a cluster of galaxies that is about 4 billion light years away. That is billion with a B light years away. Yeah. So when the light left those galaxies, uh, the Earth had formed. That's pretty much it. That I was going to say, it didn't history. even have acne yet. Like we weren't, it, w it was not even a toddler. Yeah, so this, this light left those galaxies a long, long time ago. Um, but... These galaxies, these fuzzy white blobs that are near the center here, they're all interacting with each other. This is a cluster of galaxies about 4 billion light years away, and they are so massive mm -hmm. that they're warping the space around them. Mm -hmm. And because of that, they're acting as a thing called a gravitational lens. The objects that are behind them, the light is bent around these galaxies, this cluster of galaxies, it's bent around them and comes to us. So if you look at these weird, like, elongated smudges, those elongated smudges are galaxies behind this cluster, much, much further away than we would be able to see normally. And in fact, in this view right here, if you look at this kind of elongated smudge that's there near the top, and then follow it around to the one that's kind of near the bottom in the middle, those are the same galaxy. Mm -hmm. At least I think they are. We need spectra to confirm that, but I'm pretty sure those are the same galaxy. But like, if and you look, you're just seeing two views of yeah. the same galaxy. You're if, seeing if you an look, optical illusion. If you look at the structure here, you've got the bright shiny bit, and then there's like a single bright spot, and then this this sort of long blue spot. So you see you see this right here. What I'm I'm talking about? Oh yeah. And if we go down here, you see it again, but it's reversed. So it's, it, the gravity is, is, uh, the, the space is warped so much that it's a funhouse mirror. Yeah. That's a really good way to describe it. Yeah. And, and, and in this fact, one, they did do a spectra on this one and this one are the same galaxy as well. Yeah. I was going to say, if you look on the other side, you'll see other ones. If you've ever heard of a thing called an Einstein ring or an Einstein cross, this is the kind of thing that they're talking about. Yeah. You're seeing the same object. You're seeing Ouch. that light bent around it so that you see multiple ghost images of the same yeah. thing. So real quick. So, okay, this, hang on, let me get something that's safe to, to drop. Okay. So this, you see this, I've got, this is, this is what I use to wipe uh, the sweat off of me when I'm using virtual reality. See this? I hit the microphone, but you know, it falls. That's what we call gravity. Gravity is not a force that pulls things down. Gravity. Although it, it, what? it, it feels that way. It feels that to way. To us on earth, but it's technically not right. Yeah. What gravity actually is, is things with mass, all things with mass, even this, um, <laughs> deform space. And things with huge mass deform space a lot, which is why when you drop something, it falls down because down is where the center of mass of Earth is. And that's the biggest thing that's close to us. So it drops down. Now, like back in the day when you were a kid or maybe not even then, like I remember we had one at Haynes Mall. There was a thing you could put a coin in into the little slot and it would roll around uh and around and around until it eventually went down a hole that is a brilliant like 2d demonstration of what a black hole is yeah 
like so imagine if you put a coin in and it goes around if it could go around forever without dropping down the hole that's an orbit like it's not so much that uh that like we're we've lassoed ourselves to the sun or something it's just that we're going around at, at this one point because of our speed around the edge of this bowl and we'll do that forever because well not forever but for all intents and purposes forever because of uh there's there's no nothing no other forces really pushing us or slowing us down so that's why we're in orbit around the sun like the moon is yeah. in orbit around us it's got just enough speed to where it's moving away from us a very tiny amount every year well, that's uh, an oversimplification but yes we're not trying to get super technical here, Clues. It's fine. Yeah, I know. Well, I didn't know that you were going to actually go this deep into the warping of space-time. Otherwise, I would have brought more diagrams. But uh, because... So because space... That, that was all just a setup for this. Because space is warped by things with mass. And I said, things with bigger mass warp space even more. So the moon warps space a lot. Earth warps space a lot more. The sun warps space a lot more. A galaxy warp space a lot, lot more. And a cluster of galaxies warp space so much. A lot, lot, lot more. Yeah. Yes. Now, and a black hole is when you warp it so much that you, you poke a hole. Whoops. But <laughs> pretty much. Pretty much. Um, now, because light has to travel through space to get to us, if space is warped, that means light follows it along. And that's why stuff like this happens. Like this this mirrored galaxy over here that I pointed out. It's back there somewhere. But because it's coming f from uh, behind this cluster of galaxies to get to us, the light uh, from it follows space. And because space is so incredibly bent from all of this mass, we get this frankly insane effect that... If you can't tell, the, I, I love the whole concept of this. This is why I stole this whole thing from Clues. As a matter of fact, this part of the image is what I keep using. Like, I've I've uh, zoomed in, snipped it out, put little circles around it. And this is what I'm posting on social media. I'm like, look at how insane this is. And to see all of this so clearly and with such... Because gravitational lenses, like the, the famous picture of the Einstein cross is just five lights if you don't know what you're looking at. Like it's, okay, like it's boring. <laughs> and, but gravitational lensing, we've known about gravitational lensing for a long time. In fact, gravitational lensing was proven during a solar eclipse, I think, right? It, it was in fact, yes. Yeah, because we know where stars are. Like, we can't see the stars that are behind the sun because the sun's in the damn way. So, we know where stars are when the sun's not there. So, the, when the sun was in the way and there was a solar eclipse that completely blocked out the light of the sun, we could see where the stars are and calculate how far the light would be bent because the sun was in the way. And it worked. Is that not insane? <laughs> it, that That is insane. And in this is way. that... On an yeah, entirely mind-bogglingly huge level. And I love it. <laughs> wow, I got really uh, excited about gravitational lensing there at the end, didn't I? Damn right I did, because that stuff is fascinating. So, you might think we're done now that we've talked about the amazing images, but you'd be wrong. In the fourth and final video, Clues and I talk about even more cool stuff. You see, the JWST is about more than just the pretty space pictures. So, we'll explain what else it can do, why that's so incredibly fascinatingly awesome, and even what actual good could come from this floating Lego platform thing that's so far away. So, be sure to subscribe to The Deep End if you don't want to miss it. But until then, I've been Chewy, waving and drowning, and I want to thank all you pooligans for joining me. See you next time.